Okay, here we are, so we will do it in Spanish, but you have translators if you need it. Bueno, bienvenidos, bienvenidos a esta... Welcome to this uh, talk, the purpose of which is to talk about a big challenge, that is uh, the G20, especially here in BA and the new agenda. We have a luxury panel, left of me, the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, um, Susana Malcorra. Welcome, Susana. Left of her, Hans Paul Berkner, Chairman of Boston Consulting Group. He came especially from Germany. He is the global strategist. Welcome. Left of him, Philip Rosler, responsive, regional responsible, anything that has to do with engagement of the World Economic Forum. Welcome. And then Julia Pomares, who is the representative of CPEC, who is the Center for the Implementation of Public Policies for Equity and Growth, where public policy, equity, and other things related to growth are studied. Because we have 30 minutes for the whole session, the idea is for you to participate. I'm going to give you the floor as we move along, because we don't have enough time for too much time. Let's start with the minister asking about the challenge of this G20 in Argentina. Thank you very much, and thank you for organizing this uh, meeting. We definitely have uh, bear a very big responsibility because we have the challenge of organizing the G20 meeting. When we suggested to become candidates, we knew we were taking on board a very hefty task. When we received the confirmation of all of the G20 members that our proposal was being accepted, we felt all of a sudden the weight on our shoulders. It is indeed a very uh, hefty job from a logistics, security, and infrastructure point of view, but also right now in the world to find an agenda that actually builds common spaces. What we have in mind from the Argentine perspective is to work with an agenda that takes the Argentine priorities on board, of course, but also to join all of Latin America to give a Latin America perspective for the G20 issues. And I would also talk about a South, South uh, perspective because it is a constructive uh, perspective not to split but to join. That it will help us understand that some of the things that we have in mind right now has a number, has different angles or perspectives, and the emerging countries' perspective is important. And that's why we are putting so much emphasis on this meeting. You know that we all have uh, the World uh, Trade Organization meeting in December of this year. Uh, we had uh, thought. Uh, that as a first step towards the G20, and now it's a real challenge. So we are uh, deploying a big effort to reinstate Argentina in the world in the most significant fora, but also to contribute from our own standpoint in, to a projection to G20. This uh, leads me to ask Mr. Gurner, sentiment on the rise, how can C20 adapt and maintain its relevance? For, for use? Yes. For Mr. Rusla? Yes. Okay, so that's a good question. So, um, I guess that if you can prove that free trade, open market and fair competition is still good for the people, then you have the legitimacy you will need to go ahead with some free trade agreements either on a multilateral body, on a global level, or even bilateral or interregional. So that is the main issue. So at the end, you should create via free trade, again, growth in the different countries, and based on the growth, hopefully jobs, because that's the main question for the people on the ground. And again, so there's a question of legitimacy. And as long as you can deliver on this, so I think then you will have some people who are certainly in favor of free trade agreements on the different levels. 
Mr. Paul Bergner, uh, there's another question about uh, the world that have changed since Donald Trump arrival. What do you think about that and how the agenda of G20 will change? Well, it remains to be seen. I think we are, uh, you know, have resorted to tea leaf readings over the last uh, uh, few weeks and months. And um, um, so in, in many newspapers, you have a day-by-day -day, um, interpretation of what happened in the White House or what didn't happen and whether handshakes were done or too long and so forth. I think it's... Um, I think we, we just have to, to see how things play out. Obviously, uh, it is important to uh, engage with uh, President Trump, um, and many leaders from the world have already done so. I mean, President Xi will join him in Florida, in uh, uh, I think, tomorrow. And so I, I think we, we just have to see how things play out um, and, uh, and not to read too much into some Twitter messages and so forth. Uh, things will, I, I'm pretty sure, will work out because also it has been in the interest of the U.S. to have um, the world economy moving along in a positive way. And that's ultimately also Donald Trump's uh, interest to have, uh, you know, high uh, employment in the U.S., to have uh, good growth um, and disturbing that uh, through some rash uh, actions uh, is not in his interest nor is in the interest of the U.S. That's why I would... Um, I would try to uh, uh, not to read too much into certain words or words that have been left out, like in the uh, in the uh, finance minister's um, communique uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we need to be um, uh, maybe not relaxed, but we should be uh, thoughtful and uh, engaging in discussions. And I think over time we'll we'll get to the right results. Julia, siendo un poco a la agenda que hay en Julia, going to the agenda international arena that is related to G20. We are talking about populism that remains in some places in Latin America and a new economy. What is the scenario you have in mind? Well, I believe that as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was saying, Argentina under the leader leading the G20 has great opportunities. And the main challenge is how to reach the trade-off between a strategic agenda that has an impact that shows that the multilateral forum really gets some results and how to make sure that that agenda does not divide, does not generate more tensions inside the countries. Now, this tension between strategy and focus without generating further divisions, not splitting, that's the main challenge for Argentina. And I also believe there is another topic, that is, how do we manage for Latin America to have a more coordinated agenda, which is a big opportunity for Argentina, as the minister was saying, to show a strategy together with Mexico and Brazil, but with all, all of the region, and how to make sure that the voice of the region is heard in the, by decisions made in the G20. Minister, the data, last data of Venezuela and the region were uh, discussed throughout the day today in the framework of the different talks. Do you think the scenario for next year will be different when Argentina will host this G20? You mean in the Latin America scenario? Yes. Well, to begin with, we have a number of elections in the region. So that's a first step. Having so much electoral activity uh, will have an impact on the scenario we are going to be facing. Now, <clears throat> I believe we should look at Latin America to some extent as if we were trying to take a picture or a movie from a little uh, like a drone. Why? Well, because sometimes we get confused between the assets, the values, and the opportunities of the region. First, I think we have to understand that the region, generally speaking, is a region living in a framework of respect to democratic institutions, a region that having been for many and lengthy periods under the threat of non-elected governments, today it is a region that respects democracy and that within and it lives within this uh, institutional framework which is governance that provides for opportunities to the region one 
Second, it is a region that has no conflicts, no armed conflict. In a world where there are many potential conflicts somewhere, having a region without any conflicts is significant. Three, it's a region when there are differences, it does have instruments uh, to solve these differences. So, and we're doing that. It's a region with huge natural reserves. We were talking about food safety today, which is the long-term risk, food security, I mean, together with water. It's a region where we clearly have dealt with the topic, but it can project solutions towards the rest of the world. So from that perspective, I believe that when we criticize the region so much, we lose sight and we do not have enough perspective with the facts. This being said, this leads us to believe that we will have, we are in a region that has a good projection. We will lead the UNASUR as of have mid-April. It will allow us to build an agenda with a good thing regarding the three countries represented in G20. When you find a common agenda, it's not finished yet, mind you, but when you finish that, we believe the central axis of the agenda is labor, generating jobs. That will be the main shaft. Why? Well, we believe that if we can develop a positive agenda that can find some responses who, that is found by nobody today, that is a bridge constructing agenda, a bridge constructing agenda with the US, China, Europe, the rest of the world, the emerging countries and the developing countries. This will be merged with something else, which is education. G20 has never dealt with education. We believe that here we have to do some work linked to the job opportunities, of course, but in education, both in terms of quality education, system quality education, and continuous education. That will be the re-employment of people, focusing very specially on gender and equal opportunities and on the education of the little girls because it has a number of consequences. These two issues will be on our agenda and we will build on what China has done with develop, uh, sustainable development and what Germany has done on Africa. But this will be the main gist of our work. Important to include the employment and uh, also the education and food security in this agenda. So first let me mention that it's very encouraging to listen to you, Excellency, as a minister, but also to listen to your president this morning. Because now facing the incoming chair of Argentina of the G20 gives us and the entire community two opportunities. First, for the first time, you just mentioned it again, education is one critical point in Argentina's G20 agenda. That means job skills, vocational training. And that's mm -hmm. fascinating and the best way to fight for the legitimacy you asked for before of free trade if this is part of a trade agenda. Second, the president mentioned this morning, and it was quite interesting, as a president in Argentina, referring to Mercosur, <laughs> that if we do see some, let me say it, euphemistic, domestic focus in the US in terms of trade, that is a plea for the rest, Latin America, to come closer together. We are stand ourselves as a platform for regional integration and development. So use opportunity, and the president himself mentioned that why do we have so many agreements like, or even bodies like Mercosur and Pacific Alliance? Why don't we try to bring this together, or you, to bring this together to have some identity, but at the same time some trading block at the end and fostering intra regional trade, which is quite successful. So I'm coming from Germany as Mr. Birkner, and you know, we, you know the tiny country Netherlands, right? And certainly China, but the trade volume with Netherlands is still higher than the trade volume with China, because Netherlands is our direct neighbor, and that shows the, the success of a single market. So don't forget this, and maybe if you talk about the different styles, Mercosur and 
again, Pacific aligned, I think it makes a lot of sense to think through if you can use the leadership incoming next December, next year, as a D20 share to push two things forward, education, skills, vocational training, and the question of regional integration. We are ready for one question. Augusto from Confederação Nacional da Indústria de Brasil. Normalmente, o G20 é mais efetivo quando o tema demanda coordenação. When the issues require coordination, or BEPS, the case of Syria, how do you think education that is not a problem of an international scale can be effective. I talked about education, but from the viewpoint of uh, job opportunities, what is clear is that nobody up to this time has found a, an answer, not even our wise friends from BCG. Nobody has found this silver bullet saying, this is how we have to address and solve the problem that worries people, that is my job, my work in the medium and, short and long term. We haven't found a solution yet. So we want employment, labor to be the core because it's important for all of us, for Argentina in particular, so we are aligning agendas. But we believe that putting work, labor at the center moves us away from the discussion about whether globalization is good or bad, uh, technology, it's work, labor, that's at the center of our discussions. What we know is that labor employment will have multiple transformations in the life of any individual. So we usually say that the education we are delivering to our children will not be useful for the work they will have to do in 10 years' time. So there is a fragility in the education model we have nowadays. So thinking in terms of employment. So we believe that that creates an opportunity for coordination. Note the following. I had a bilateral meeting with Singapore with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, who also met the president. Singapore, which is a very different country from ours, has found that this issue of disruption in employment is a big problem, and they've started creating an investment model in personal accounts of their citizens aimed at retraining individuals for future work. They know that employers do not worry about the future work of other individuals because they will be elsewhere. So the state has to intervene, but individuals have to have the freedom to decide how they want to do that. So it is one possible model. Maybe it's not the only one, but we have to start discussing these issues because they lie at the core of the fragility of the continuity of labor. And the great concern citizens have, and it's a big challenge citizens have and pose to their leaders. So it's in the essence of this movement or shift towards populism, and it's at the core of the fragility of the democratic system nowadays. So it's key for the future, and we believe we have opportunities there. I think with all due respect, the, um, I don't think that the uh, retraining can be done and should be done by governments. Uh, I think it is a job for... Uh, I didn't say that. Eh? Maybe there was a translation but, but, interpretation mistake. What I said is money put in an account so the citizen knows where to assign it. Okay, so maybe it was a... But I think the, the key really is for, for, uh, for people um, to, learn, to continue to learn on the job and for companies to continue uh, investing in its people. And I think there is, in many parts of the world, there is an interest of, of the companies to do so uh, because they also want to hold on to talented people. Um, but that the, is true if the company has a future. But what if the company is going to disappear? Well, if the company does disappear, I think the programs that we've seen, the government in setting up some transfer societies to uh, train people, have not been very effective. And I think um, 
you know, certainly, I mean, jobs, as you emphasized, is really key. Um, I think there will be a sharing of, uh, of experience, uh, what works and what doesn't work. But I think it, uh, it will be quite a different, and, uh, a different task across the world. And what works here in Argentina will, may not work in, in other parts of the world and so forth. So I, I think we are all grappling with the situation, even in China, when you close down coal mines and steelworks. You know what you do with these uh, people who have lost their jobs. I mean, they will not become software engineers for artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, and so uh, making that work, I think, will be uh, the key, uh, one of the key challenge for every country, but in very different constellations. And I fully agree with you. I, we also haven't found the solution yet. It, it will be uh, a very big task uh, in order to ensure social peace. Julia, y en este marco también suma tu, tu apoyo. And in this framework, what you said about institutions is important. How are institutions evolving towards greater transparency, or is it just an aspiration in the region? I think the G20 with the 2030 development objectives has a great opportunity to show progress. The goals for 2030 set a clear path to show how institutions like G20 can monitor the results, the outcomes obtained in terms of development. And clearly, I think that the path to curb the tensions uh, brought about by populism are effective in as much as there is a sustained inclusive development path. And the 2030 UN agenda puts a clear goal and target, and uh, G20 can help us achieve our goals. This is one of the uh, most uh, dear topics. The 2030 Agenda was a great collective construction in the world which addressed the substance of the matter which we are discussing today with globalization. It was called otherwise, but when it said no, not leave anyone behind, they were addressing precisely that core. The Agenda was very rich and very well built except for one aspect that is financing. We fell short in that regard. We couldn't reach an agreement. And the elegant uh, way out that we managed to achieve collectively was to say financing will take place based on public-private participation. It will come from an integration of value chains. It will come from allowing the developing world to find uh, investments in, in, in infrastructure, integrating chains. But all that is being challenged by the discussion as regards globalization. What I care about is my part and not the others. So what I believe I have, we have to do is to focus our 2030 agenda and the link between the 2030 agenda regarding globalization and some of its challenges. Because if this virtuous circle breaks down, the sustainability of the 2030 agenda will be lost. So there is an additional element, an additional turn that we have to take to ensure that we maintain the sustainability of the 2030 agenda. We're, we can't hear the question. My question is for the panel and for the minister in particular. Something that can arise in G20 and in international discussions is in general is multilateralism at a point in time when the big powers appear to prefer bilateral relations that puts medium-sized countries at a disadvantage like Argentina. Do you consider that is something about uh, which Argentina should have a position? Is it a question for the entire panel? Maybe the other panel members can answer before me. Anyone wants to answer? What we are seeing at the G20 is that uh, this is an opportunity platform for talking with each other uh, bilaterally, you know, in smaller groups and also, of course, in the overall large group. But I think we should not, uh, and we should see this as one element and, and one uh, part of interaction that happens throughout the year. Uh, 
uh, between uh, leaders of the world. Now we see it in, in Florida, uh, between President Trump and, and Xi Jinping. And we should not assume that everything has to be resolved within G20. I think it's good to have a common platform to get to know each other, to have lots of uh, interaction so that people can uh, really uh, address uh, issues step by step. Uh, I think one always focuses too much on what is coming out of this G20 meeting. I think it's uh, the end of a long series of discussions, preparations. Argentina will, will start preparing in a, in a few months' time. Um, and um, I think one, one needs to, um, to also understand that not all issues will have to be resolved by, by all 20. I mean, Argentina has not been participating very actively beforehand. And uh, it still was part of the G20. Uh, there are some certain members who have very different ideas about certain things, and still you get together. So let's not overload this, this meeting and the G20 with too many expectations. I think if um, people develop a good uh, ability to talk with each other, to address certain issues, and make some progress, then I think we have achieved a lot. Sí, este decir que coincido. I agree. I agree with what you just said about expectations. Maybe the question and the issue of multilateralism applies more to our WTO meeting at the end of this year, which is an essentially multilateral environment and where we are working hard to make sure that we find the way to make the agenda move forwards. So it's not. So we don't uh, reach a standstill in a multilateral trading system. As regards G20, I agree. G20 is not a multilateral forum. It's a club of a few countries that get together, and the main purpose is the generation of networking and personal knowledge of the various leaders because that creates a space of trust that's useful to then discuss uh, issues at a multilateral and bilateral level. But secondly, G20 has to be able to create, open up discussions at the political level about some issues that are of the interest of all. Then there will be mechanisms established, some of which should be multilateral because the G20 should be able to project or go beyond the that close club, and that's the reason why we are thinking about an agenda that will bring us together around a common theme, which will then be discussed in different environments. One last question. I know G20. I was in Los Cabos, Mexico in 2012, and it is a challenge. I agree, Minister. I have a question for all the speakers. One of the criticisms is that most outcomes are soft power. They are not binding. How can we make sure that the outcomes of this G20 entail more hard power? And second, what uh, mechanisms, follow-up mechanisms, would you recommend as speakers so that it's not just a conference, a single conference, but uh, we can make sure that there is continuity. Mr. Rosler, would you, would you like to answer? The G20 is a natural grown and fast grown body, right? It started first as a finance minister meeting, then it evolves into meeting of heads of state, heads of government. And then it's a first step to have some impact on the ground because you have the most powerful people in the room, the G20, heads of state, heads of government. However, so given that we don't have yet an agreement, so it's more that they talk about a general strategy, general direction, but this is also needed because if you come to concrete contracts or treaties, then you ended up like the WTO with you know long-term negotiations and it will not much faster <laughs> than the question of having more protocols or even strategic discussions among the G20. But if they address the right topics, such we just heard, the regional integration or maybe the question of education, I think then we can have, even in the midterm, see some impact rather than waiting for long-term negotiation with some free trade agreements in detail among the G20. Ultima pregunta. 
sorry. One last question. I follow G20 affairs for Switzerland, and as a non-G20 country, I would uh, very much uh, take a different stance from, from uh, the person that I've spoken before. I hope that no hard decisions come out of G20. Um, <laughs> G20 ultimately is a club defined by countries, defined by their size. It's not the most innovative, it may be, it's not the, most, the fastest growing, it may be, but it's just the size. So uh, a smaller country, we are always quite quite critical and I'm, I'm very, very pleased and encouraged, uh, Minister, by what you are saying that, uh, that what is actually the ultimate goal is really to, to, to build this, this atmosphere of trust among the largest economies in the world. Thank you very much. Excellent. So we have time for the last question. Sorry. <laughs> Your last. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I am glad that you mentioned education is ag in the agenda. As you know, that United Nations defined uh, literacy as a uh, reading and writing, but now um, basically everything has been changed. We have, uh, we are living in a so much digital uh, world, and maybe uh, our education system worldwide doesn't qualify to basically train children for new era. How you would address and redefine education system through uh, You're in the agenda? You're asking me the question that we are supposed to find an answer for in G20. So, like, like, look, what I can say is that clearly, clearly, uh, there is, we, we have a problem, a central problem of jobs, and that associated to that central problem, we have a central problem of skills gap against the jobs we have, and more importantly, the ones that we may have or we may not have in the future. And that can only be bridged through education, training, vocational training, training on the job, etc. But there is not a clear answer yet. First, on how we adapt to this changing environment of jobs and joblessness and how we make sure that that gap is reduced and that is what we are thinking about putting on on the table and again with a view that first is from the perspective of our citizens is what is at the heart of their concerns so we feel that it would be a way to reflect in g20 at g20 level the most senior leadership in the world, things that are close to the heart of our people. But second, we collectively do not have an answer to it. So that's why we feel it will be a conducive agenda that should allow us to come together. And nobody can disagree with education as a key topic. That's right. <laughs> it's and like up, apple pie in motherhood. motherhood. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> we were clever then. Fíjense, habíamos arrancado con... We had started with a trigger that was how anti-globalization sentiment that's been growing worldwide and how G20 could adapt and maintain its relevance in a context where there's increasing anti-globalization sentiment, but we delved into the in-depth agenda, employment, the longer term, food security, a group of countries, nobody quantified it, that accounts for almost 85% of worldwide GDP. It's not just any group, but the one that sets the upcoming agenda for that eight, the 85% of GDP for those that are outside of that. And the word that sounded most, regardless of the roles and the various roles we have here, transparency, food security, employment, but also education, that was a key word an agenda that did not used to have education as its main focus. But fortunately, this will be our, the priority when we host uh, the G20 meeting in Argentina. Thank you.